I was good to you. I I dragged your ass off off the Yorkshire moors. You hadn't got a job. You got nowhere to go. You were dead and buried. Felipe Massa drove me round, and Rubens as well. They drove me round, and it was just awful. I mean, it was the most awful experience I've ever had in all my life. When they told me that you were going to be on the program, I said, "Oh Jesus, do I still owe him money?" Um, <laughs> yes, Rob yes. Medley, um, because he was always. No, that's not true. I don't know you were dying. How is EJ as a boss? Oh, my God. Hello and welcome to Formula for Success. I'm David Coulthard and alongside me in the virtual world, as always, is my old sparring partner, Eddie Jordan. Ah, yes, David, that's me. You've got some big friend of both of ours there as a special guest today. So, uh, David, you're in the prime seat here. Why don't you go ahead with Rob? Right, I will indeed. Well, you've given away a little teaser there of the first name of the man who's joining us. He is an engineering legend. He's worked with Jordan. He got out of there as quickly as possible. He was at Williams. And, of course, he became uh, most famous at Ferrari, working alongside Felipe Massa. It is Rob Smedley. How are you, Rob? Hello, boys. Hey. Thank you very much for having me. What is that growl that, that, that EJ just did? Is that normal? <laughs> is, that, is that standard for this podcast? That's um, 100% standard. It's something that started at the beginning. And um, uh, I don't know, it stayed there. So we might have to change it fairly soon. Uh, Rob, I want you to be kind to me. Don't say any nasty things about what I was like as a boss, because I was good to you. I I dragged your ass off off the Yorkshire moors. You hadn't got a job. You got nowhere to go. You were dead and buried. I gave you the chance to run a race car that actually won Grand Prix. Jesus, you should be on your knees night and day for this. <laughs> so, so the best part about this is that so Eddie. Like anybody from 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 EJ's place who went on to have a career, um, and I don't count myself in in that group, but there was a lot of good guys that come out of that place. I have to say, and he always used to pull us aside, um, like latterly, and, and and say, "I fucking made you." <laughs> and then I remember one day we were in the nefarious amber lounge and i can't remember the city we were in i was with a uh with with one of our mutual mates called sam michael and he pulled us aside and he said uh, and, and and he and he gave us this nonsense again about you know i fucking made you and sam turned around in his in his aussie drawl and went no eddie we made you <laughs> and i think that was probably there's a little bit of truth in that because you were very good at picking up uh, young lads um, and you had a really good knack in, in how much you paid them as well. Um, but, you know, it was, a, it was a great race team. We did some, um, we did some good stuff there and uh, I learned a lot. And I still look back and it is my fondest memories of, of be working in a Formula One team. We had a lot of fun, but we were a good team as well. I've actually, I, I think that was some really nice words, EJ. It, you've silenced the Jordan. He's sitting there. He's not used to people actually giving him a compliment about <laughs> that being uh, some of your fondest memories. It is a, a tough industry, Formula One. So I think just taking you back, what on earth got you drawn to the sport? What was your first big opportunity? Was it Eddie, as he's mentioned, dragging you off? He said the Yorkshire Moors. Um, the question would be, what the hell was he doing on the Yorkshire Moors? Um, <laughs> so take us back and, and give us some insight to the journey. What's something that's going to be inspirational to young men and women out there at university who, who think, I can, I can be an engineer in Formula One? So uh, good luck with that to all the young men and women out there who want to be engineers in, in Formula One. Um, but I, I, I mean, I wasn't actually on the Yorkshire Moors, funnily enough. Um, I was, uh, I actually went to school in the northeast of England um, and in, in a town called Middlesbrough. And my dad used to watch Formula One uh, back in the 80s. And I used to think it didn't look particularly exciting. And then he took me to Silverstone um, and I was absolutely blown away by it. I just thought this was absolutely visceral. Um, so we, we uh, I, I got up close to the cars as well. I managed to get in the paddock. We, we legged over the fence um, at Silverstone. So every time I see Stuart Pringle now, I still um, I have to run away from him because I, I owe him for paddock passes and centre passes and, and all the rest of it that we've never actually paid for. 
Um, but when when I saw these cars, I just thought they were things of beauty. And then, you know, that was in the 80s. Um, and I just decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an engineer um, in Formula One. I never had any kind of, you know, delusions or anything like that about being a driver, which I think some engineers actually do. <laughs> Um, but I was just all about these cars and, and, and the engineering. No, they do, don't they? I mean, you, you listen to them when they, we're talking. We all talk a good game, right, when we're looking at the squiggly lines. Um, but I've been in a Formula One car a few times in, in the three-seater at Fiorano, and it's, it's not my cup of tea. Um, that's <laughs> understating it. I, I was nearly sick. Uh, Felipe Massa drove me around, and Rubens as well. They drove me around, and it was just fucking awful. I mean, it was the most <laughs> awful experience I've ever had in all my life. Uh, and we had this dead man's button, and Rubens said, and I said, no, I don't want to do it. And Rubens, and it was when Rubens was leaving and going to Honda, and I said, if I release the button, will you, uh, will you, w- will you stop? And he said, yeah, yeah, because there's a really annoying beep in my ear because they used it for all like the Philip Morris guests and stuff like that. So there's like a dead man's button. So if you kind of, you know, if you, you held it down and when you released it, then it beeped in the driver's ears. And uh, um, anyway, so I jumped in the car and I went, please don't like scare me because, you know, I know I talk a good game, but I'm, I'm, I'm not very brave. And he kind of shot out the garage at Fiorano and halfway down the straight to turn one, I released it. And I was going, stop, stop, stop. And he continued to do three laps. And I could hear him manically laughing, like all the way around, because I could hear him, but I, I, yeah, I could hear him doing the QBE. And, 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 and then we stopped and I got out. And honestly, I was like punch drunk. And I went, what the fuck was that? I said, why did you do that? Why didn't you stop? I said, wasn't the beep annoying? And he went, no, because I, I got them to disconnect it because I know what a pussy you are. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Oh, a great experience! <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then and then I did it a few more times and, and never liked it. Um, anyway, so I've digressed. So I went to yeah. So I ended up doing all the normal things. I went to school, went to university, uh, got a half decent um, education, and then uh, I actually worked for uh, a guy called Mike Pilbeam for a while, um, who is. Uh, Kyron Pilbeam's dad, who works uh, in Formula One now. Uh, and Mike had worked for the BRM team, and I learned a load of stuff off Mike about design and engineering and all the rest of it. And then very quickly after that, ended up ended up at EJ's place. He dragged me off the Yorkshire Moors. I don't know what you were doing up on the Yorkshire Moors, nor me, um, Eddie, but yeah. So yeah, and I went there, and it was just brilliant. It was It was such a good team. Um, it was, it was, we were small and scrappy. How was EJ as a boss? Oh, lunatic. I mean, like off the charts, like mad. Uh, but, but I think that you get, I mean, that's just his personality, right? You you cannot hide behind that. Um, but I think that when I look, I've got a lot of, I wish he wasn't on this podcast because I could say nice things about him, but I have such a huge amount of respect because now I've kind of, you know, started businesses and a little bit older and being around the block, you realize what it must have been like to start a team um, back in the 90s with a couple of million quid. And I think that there was only people like Eddie um, could have Eddie could have ever like made it a success that they did. But it was, you know, it was just, I, I do have to say like massive like hats off and the success that, he made of Jordan, you know, along with Gary and, and, and all of the other ledgers that worked there. Um, but it was a just, it was such a good grounding for me because it was a small team. You could get stuck into everything. I remember, you know, that transition into that year 2000 when we had electronic gizmos and, and we rewrote all of the code. And there was probably four or five of us in the race engineering department. Um, which is race engineering, vehicle dynamics, tire dynamics, everything, you know, and that way you'd now you have like 300 people now. There was about five of us and we did everything. Uh, and all of those guys actually have gone on to do really good stuff in, in Formula One. And we just had a lot of fun uh, and won some races um, in a car that probably, you know, that 99 car, so I come in right at the back end of that, that was a really good car. Um, and then won some races. When did we? When, what year did we win in Brazil, Eddie? Was that two thousand and one or two thousand and three? Three. Three. Yeah. Two thousand and three. You're welcome, both of you. By the way, because uh, I should have won that race. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got. Well, everybody should have done. <laughs> 
We were the Rob, only two. Can I interrupt? Still on the track, I think. DC. Yes, yes interrupt. DC. <laughs> he cannibalised the grid in Spa, which not once but twice. He he tried very hard to wipe out poor old Michael Schumacher. You're he welcome. He blamed Eddie Irvine for causing the crash, which was his crash, and he poor old Eddie was an easy target. And and then you go to Brazil. He uh, Alonso. Uh, uh, I think Mark Webber, everyone had the crash of their unbelievable season. And it only left one car left, which was on fire. And that was um, yes. Fis- Fisichella. And we won the race. So well done to you. Um, God, you never forget that. But there were some, sc- there was a lot of scams in between all of that. So I'm keeping quiet here, Rob. I just want to hear what you're, I haven't spoken to you for ages. So to have you on our show is absolutely brilliant and well done. But DC, please continue because uh, I don't want to be involved in these uh, inquiries or interrogations of what went on in the past. Well, I will do. And actually then, so just uh, again, uh, maybe a slightly more open uh, question rather than the specific ones of, of your experience at Jordan and then and then moving through to Ferrari. But I'm actually curious, I've never asked this of, a, of an engineer the I, I see race engineers as you know part your engineering degree and knowledge of the car and understanding of vehicle dynamics and how to exploit aero maps and all of that good stuff uh, that must really you know turn you on. Um, but you're also psychologists, aren't you? You know you, you've you've got to you've got to understand your driver, and we're we're delicate flowers on occasion. Um, so how, how, was that a surprise to you when you developed into that role or did you just, you know, you're a very sort of salt of the earth type person, straight talker. Is that just your background where a driver was a driver, you, you, you wanted to get the best out of them and give your best and it didn't really matter whether they were buddies or not. How, how did you approach all that? And what, what would you say is the thing that sets apart the, the race engineers from other talented engineers within a, a Formula One organization. So I think I think that's a really good point, DC. I think like to be a good race engineer, you have to and it's changed a lot now, right? You know, I mean there's there's a lot more people on the car and a lot more specialists and you become a little bit more of a you know a bit more of a manager. But I think at its heart you have to have that really strong relationship with the driver. Um, and what, what you're trying to do all the time, because I, I tell you what, what, what the, what, what drives me, what drives me is, is, is just being competitive is winning, right? The only thing I, I care about is, 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 is winning. Um, and, and that's especially true when I was running cars and therefore you've got all of these, like, like you, you talked about, you've got all of these things that you need to have first principle knowledge of, you know, you need to have, you know, all your maths and physics and all the rest of it, because that's what kind of you, how, how the car works, you know, whether it, you're trying to exploit the aerodynamics or the tires or the mechanical part the side of the car, whatever it is. But then, but then there's another bit that if you don't know how to get the best out of that, then you're missing 80% of, of, of really your, your performance. And, and, and that's the driver. Um, and I think that I always had good relationships with um, the guys that I engineered. Um, some of them, you know, and as you go through your career, you go from being like the young guy who, you know, the driver kind of um, tolerates to being uh, the, 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 the older, more paternal guy who the driver, I guess, in some way looks up to. Um, and I don't know, I think that every driver that I've ever worked with is, is always, has always been very different. Um, they've always had different personalities in and out of the car. And really, it's up to the engineer to be able to, to get the best out of that. You know, the drivers are the drivers, right? They, they, they do what they do, and they, they have a very specific role in the team. And it's not up to the driver to kind of mold or meld his personality into that of the engineer. It has to be the other way around. Um, so I think I was always very adaptable with all of the guys that, that I work with. Um, and I had like a very honest and transparent and straight talking to the point of physical violence at times, not all the time. I mean, this wasn't a weekend by weekend thing, um, you know, uh, relationship with the, with the guys. Cause you've got to have, right. I mean, they're getting in the car, they're driving it at 200 mile an hour. 
they you're, you're looking for literally milliseconds of lap time you've got to trust each other you know you've got to you've got to absolutely be able to pee in each other's pockets because if you don't uh you're never going to get the best out of 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 that person um so yeah i don't know it's a it's a strange one i didn't think about it too much to be honest i just did it and uh sometimes it worked and most of the times it didn't yeah i've never actually peed in the pocket of my engineer maybe that was the the one missing ingredient (laughs) between winning a few races and actually challenging for a championship now we, we we couldn't have you on without mentioning that famous quote which will uh, forever it's possibly the most famous engineer driver quote in in the sport um, unless someone can think of something more whereas you very uh, very slowly and very deliberately went <laughs> Felipe <laughs> what was it was it Fernando yeah, yeah, um, yeah, it's so yeah. famous I can't remember Fernando is quicker than you which is a hard one to tell yeah. your driver I do remember you re- referring to him as Felipe baby as well which I loved I thought I, my engineer never called me baby yeah, so that was so, so. So at the beginning of of our working relationship together, he was he was always he was such a nervy little thing. Like and 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 anything that went wrong, he had to be like you know shouting down the 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 the, the radio about something when you could have just kind of you know you could have expressed it with emotion, but there's no need to like go off the charts with emotion. So, um, so that was the Felipe baby was a bit like that. It was kind of in the politest possible terms. Oh, shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? We've got a job to do here. Like, do we really need to be hearing about you and the white visor, clear visor you meant? Because it was raining and he couldn't see. So that was that. Uh, and you see it a little bit now, like GP with, with, with Max. Uh, you know, he has a similar relationship, I think, where it's kind of like, yeah, Max, we're busy. You know what I mean? Like, I get like the emotion and I get you driving the car, but... We're doing our bit as well. Um, and that's when the best relationships are. I think that that's two guys who have a really good relationship as well. Uh, the Fernando is faster than you, yeah, was a, was a slightly um, heavier moment for um, me and the team, uh, if I think you remember it well. Yeah, and it has become... Uh, there's, I've, I've, I often get uh, sent T-shirts and mugs and stuff in the post with uh, Fernando is faster than you. Uh, and, and actually, my, my son, uh, my oldest son, I think, is in turn will be embarrassed of my career and everything that I've done um, since, well, just for existing, because that's what teenage boys are right, like. I like, right? Um, he uh, he said, said that one of his mates at school had found that as the most famous quote in Formula One or something like that, which is a bit sad, isn't it? But people love entertainment radio yeah yeah people love entertainment but uh yeah that was a, that was an interesting sunday afternoon um and an interesting few days afterwards but there you go yeah so rob i i've sat and watched our our friend sit very patiently down in south africa so i think at this point i'm going to hand over to ej to to interrogate you or, or do whatever he normally does but before i do just one final question from my side is uh, we talk about Felipe there, lovely guy. You know, we, 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 he's got so many friends within the paddock, and clearly the demons of the World Championship that wasn't are still running with him. As we know, he he'd opened a uh, you know some sort of investigation into whether the the World Championship should have rested with him or not, given the outcome or knowledge. Uh, of the Singapore race when Nelson Piquet Jr. crashed the car there. Where, where do you sit in all that? Do you, do you Are you very much, look, he, he did everything on that day to deserve a world title, pole position, drove beautifully, won the race, or do you go, look, the racing gods have decided something else? I think that the, the racing gods have, have, have decided on, on something else, isn't it? I think, you know, I've said this before, everybody should have, you know, if, if Felipe wants to, you know, he's, 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 he's one of my best mates, and if he wants to pursue um this whole thing then everybody should be free to do what they they want to do uh my opinion of it is uh you know i'm 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 somebody anyway who who never looks back you know i don't care um about what happened yesterday i'm i'm interested in what's happening today tomorrow and and how i can affect that so you know you know felipe's has, has been pretty clear that why he wants to do this he wants to do it for uh justice as as he says, and and he has the right to be able to pursue that. You know, good on him uh, if that's what he wants to do. 
my view on it is that you know um, it would have been great to have won the world championship, the 2008 world championship in 2008. Um, we didn't, you know, Lewis won it, and the guy with the most points at the end of the season is the guy who deserves to to win it. Um, you know, however, those points are are accrued. I think um, that's that's racing, and some, you know, what it's like. You two guys know know better than me. Um, you 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 look into some points that you shouldn't have had, uh, and you kind of get points nicked off you that you should have had as well. Um, and I think that's that's the whole point why it's a it's a you know twenty race, twenty five race, whatever it is now, twenty four race world championship because. Over the course of the season, it'll all even itself out. So, so there you go. I don't know how it'll finish. I, I watch uh, that one um, from from afar, if you like, and we'll see where it gets to. Rob, um, Eddie here. I've been very quiet because uh, DC was uh, delving into all sorts of things about you, and I won't talk about you and Jordan because they were great times as far as I was concerned. Um, but I think I think you have to tell them what just one thing about Jordan, and that is we had a, a motto, and I would always write everything. I would never sign my name E J. I would write just F T B. And just for the avoidance of any doubt, do you remember what F T B was? And uh, why don't you tell the listeners what I used to write at the bottom of every memo and every note to the team? It was uh, it was fuck the begrudges. <laughs> There you go. And, um, you know, I have to say, for those people who can see or can't see, but this is, that's exactly it. It was the only thing that I have ever had a tattoo, and I put FTP, and uh, all our sons have that. Just a little bit of notice. When you said Fernando is faster than you, I think we need to tell the, the viewers and the listeners that was your way of circumventing team orders because there was a ban on team orders. We were not allowed to tell the drivers. To, I mean, if you remember Spa, I had to tell uh, Ralph Schumacher that he wasn't able to pass Damon Hill. And very soon after that, team orders came in play. And what you said to Fernando was a way of circumventing that rule. Um, and the certain other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which is a very nice, clear way you've said it, was um, the racing god. Sometimes you win and you something. So Lewis was very lucky, as we know, in, in against Massa in, in in Sao Paulo that particular year where he won the championship. Um, but then again, in Abu Dhabi, it went against him. So sometimes it plays to your favour and sometimes it plays against you. So uh, that is the look of the gods. And I really like the way that you've described it. They're the racing gods at play. And uh, that will always continue as far as I was concerned. So talking about Lewis, and this is a question really that I'm intrigued about. He's leaving Mercedes and going to Ferrari. Will he like it there? Will it suit him? What are his biggest challenges there? And how do you think he would go about it? I know there's a whole lot of questions, but maybe you could answer them um, in terms of um, should he bring his own people there, just like what Michael did in the past? Uh, how do, and, and Felipe Massa brought you. So is there something that you can advise him? Uh, I, I think he'll love it there. Uh, he is a very uh, he's 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 a driver that needs the team to be uh, very much behind him and supporting him, and I think he will love it. I think that the the Tifosi, the the the, the Ferrari fans, uh, they are unique in the world as to how passionate they are. You know, I mean, you've got Williams fans or Jordan fans or, or Mercedes fans. But they don't really, uh, they, 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 they just don't, don't reach that same level of, of, of passionate, um, you know, and almost fanatical um, obsession with, with the Ferrari team. The Ferrari team, when you're there, you, you feel like you're part of the national team. That's what it is, right? Um, so you get, when you win... Uh, they treat you very nicely and you never have to pay in any restaurants, which you can imagine for, for, for me was, was my favorite part of the whole um, experience. Um, and, uh, but, but, the, but the reality is, is that uh, when you don't do very well, they're also very uh, clear with you about that you're not their, their, their favorite person. But I think when you win them over, as somebody like Michael Schumacher did, um, you are a god, 
and I think that that will give um, Lewis the little bit of motivation that perhaps he needs. And I think it will be a two-way reciprocal thing because I think that Lewis can elevate the team that final few percent. And that's all it ever needs, right? I mean, if you look at Red Bull when it was struggling or Mercedes when it was struggling, Ferrari, you know, just before we started to, to win all those championships... Uh, it just needs, it's got all the right ingredients. It just needs that final few percent to elevate it, which Lewis can do. You know, he can bring that final few percent to, to you know, just quicken everybody's pace just that tiny bit. That's all you need. And then, and, and turn them into to a winning machine. So, you know, he's going there. He wants to win his eighth world championship. He could actually, it's, it's uh, you know, don't, don't, don't shoot me, but it, it's fairly unlikely that he will go there as eight, world, eight times world champion. But definitely uh, it is a very good opportunity for him and for the team. So good luck to him. Rob, the other question was, should, he bring, should Lewis bring you back there as one of his background team? And um, because we all know that uh, support comes in many different ways. And... Um, I do believe he's going to take a couple of people uh, from Mercedes with him. Um, could you be encouraged to go back to Ferrari or is that just you've done it and you're passing it by? It's a long way, isn't it, from uh, that, that commute Oxford to, uh, to Maranello? <laughs> um, I, 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 would, I would not deign to mention myself uh, in, in, this, uh, in, in this conversation, but should, should Lewis... Bring people back there. Uh, should should he take them there? Sorry, um, I think you have to be a little bit careful with that game because it's a game where either you are rebuilding from the ground up, um, which is what happened in the mid nineties in Ferrari, uh, and you you know when when Michael brought Ross and and, and Rory Byrne, um, you know so so they were kind of that was a ground up building exercise. I'm not sure that Ferrari are actually there. Um, now, would he bring uh, his, his his engineer Pete? Um, he might do. You know, um, he needs if if he needs somebody that he feels close to, that you know, somebody can translate what his language as a driver is into engineering. You know, that that could work um, if 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 Pete uh, wants to do it. Um, he might have his eye on other people, but I do think that you have to be a little bit careful with kind of following your driver about. Um, and then becoming like you know part of the driver's team rather than part of the team. You know the team is 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 always the most important bit here. So I don't know. Let's see. Um, time and money will talk, I guess. Um, the, the the thing then I'm going to ask you, Rob, and that is obviously you look as if you're enjoying life and you're enjoying life away from motor racing. But nevertheless, is there something in motor racing that you would? still like to achieve or is there something that you feel that is part of your bucket list that you you haven't quite it's unfinished business so to speak yeah look i i mean i've said this before you know i'm i'm, I'm lucky that i still get uh you know offers to to go and work in 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 formula one i think for me uh i'll never say never um but it has to be the right the right uh the, the, the right offer with with the right team you know um if if i go back into formula one it has to be with a group of people who are totally committed to winning and they have to demonstrate that they are totally committed to winning um you know there's enough projects and basket cases and and all the rest of it that you know i've i i've I if if I go back into Formula One now, uh, then it, you know I need to. It, as I said, it needs to be the right position. But but the team has to have the backing and the wherewithal and another you know a great group group of people there or on the horizon you know joining um, where every single Sunday afternoon or most Sunday afternoons you have a chance of winning and that's all you can ever ask, right? You can't win all the races and you shouldn't expect to win all the races. But you should be able to, you know, head towards a uh, a Grand Prix. You know, get on a plane and fly for twelve, fourteen, twenty four hours in some cases, and think, yeah, if we get everything right here, we can win it. Um, we have just as good a chance as, as anybody else. So if I went back into Formula One, um, regardless of the position, it would need to be um, 
in in that type of of scenario or at least building that type of of situation you know there might, you might not be uh in a position to win today but um, with all of the right moves and the right people and the right support from above, um, you know, you can get yourself in a, in a situation where you can win. So that's me. Rob, just um, one final bit from me before DC takes the show out and, and talks to you more about other things. Um, I, I've just got to ask you the, the thing. You know, I see the sport at the moment and I'm a little bit lukewarm about some of the things that are happening. And I'd like to say to you, you've been out of it long enough. You've seen it at the top end. But, you know, for example, I'd like your opinion on no rookies, um, no new teams, um, the engines sounding like, like a bucket of crap as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, and, you know, the new technologies, it seems to be easier for the older drivers and it's the no rookies that I have a real issue with. Just finally, before DC takes us out of here, um, could you please have your own opinion on those sort of things, please? So I actually, I, I, don't, I don't mind the, the, the sound of the engines, but I have uh, somebody said to me, oh, you've got to listen to this Bring Back V10s podcast. Uh, and it does take you back when I listen to all of that. I, and, 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 and the sound of it, you know, the sound for me of when, you know, I mentioned when, when my dad took me to the first Grand Prix and this whole fucking visceral wall of sound hit me as I walked into Silverstone and I was like, oh my God, what is that? With, with the old V10s and even V12s back then. Um, and I think that that is, is, is you know, is, is something that I miss. But, you know, again, you know, I'm a personality that, that doesn't want to look back. Uh, so I don't mind the sound of, of these, these hybrids. I think they sound pretty cool. Um, the, the no rookie thing is, is just a, a travesty, right? Uh, like where, where, you know, we, we have good enough rookies um, and it's just, it's just, not great for the sport not to have them coming through i think if you want to look more positively on that i think we've got kids like kimmy antonelli who'll be coming through in a few years uh who are great great talents there's there's some others just behind him um you know even in karting at the minute and hopefully they can translate to cars it doesn't always happen um but we we, we should have some good talent coming through and we need that right you need the you need the the, the rookies they should be the the the, the, the lifeblood of 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 drivers always coming through your third question you see how i i, I you know the, the photographic memory the third question eddie was um was about uh these cars being too easy for uh to drive i think was was that how it was framed um i think there is a little bit of that uh but i think you know again they're still these are still you still got to look at these drivers as warriors as gladiators you look what max verstappen can do with the car uh, Max is one of those drivers that would transcend any age. If you'd have put him in a, a, a V10 from, from, from the 90s, uh, or you'd have put him in something from the 60s, he'd have still driven the arse off it and still won in it. So, you know, you've still got some... some and, and Lewis is, is a similar type of driver, you know, winning machine, um, super clinical, um, you know, and we've got some good young drivers coming through as well. So I think, you know... The, the cars are different. The cars sound different. They are different to drive, but you know it's still a it's it's still a great sport. There's still some really really um, you know great elements to it. So there you go. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, no, absolutely. I I think that yeah these these quieter engines, yeah they've definitely grown on me. Um, but uh, yeah, there's nothing quite like a screaming. If you go to a rock concert, you want you don't go there on a date, do you? You, you don't go there to have a conversation. <laughs> you go there to be lost in the music, and that's what Formula One used to be. Yeah, I've actually got one, a, a, a question for the two of you because Eddie, we've talked about this before, where sometimes you just have to accept as a team that you you take a driver that you maybe don't really believe they're they're going to win a Grand Prix, but they come with a pot of cash which keeps your team afloat, and you uh, are one of the great survivors, Eddie, as as a as a team team owner. Uh, so uh, maybe Eddie, you can expand a little bit on and how difficult that is for you to look at your engineers when you say, hey, we've got. Archie Gemmel, or whoever the driver, I don't want to use a, a name of someone, uh, a, a name and shame, but you, you say to your engineers, we're putting a driver on the car uh, because they're paying us a bunch of money rather than because I think they're good. And then the follow up, then when you've answered that, EJ, for you, Rob, if you end up with a driver that you don't really believe 
is at the level, but it's your job. And, and maybe you had that. And again, I'm not asking you to name and shame, but maybe you did have that at some point in your career where you're working with someone that you go, oh, Jesus, we are not going to win unless, you know, something really remarkable happens. So for both of you, how, how do you, within the spirit of believing that you want to go to compete and win each weekend, how do you deal with that? EJ, first of all, on taking the money. Um, first of all, uh, taking the money. Um very often, um, actually, these two questions are, can be rolled into the same thing because one of the best drivers and the most clinical driver and the guy who was so calm and so underrated it was somebody that won in one of Rob's cars at Jordan, <clears throat> which is Heinz Harald Frensen. Absolute legend of a driver. Calm, quiet, unassuming. He is one of, uh, beyond question, one of the easiest people to work with, certainly from team owner. Rob will tell us about his engineering prowess uh, later. So uh, he had a little bit of support, but ver very little. But then you think about it that I, halfway through the season, had to sack him, um, which caused me unbelievable pain. Um, and I had to sack him... Um, for Takumo Sato, who was not in the same level as Heinz Harald. Um, and you knew you weren't going to... It was a miracle if you got the car back in one piece after about five <laughs> laps. That was the first thing. I mean, he had, he had an ability to crash a car that no one else had. I mean, he could... He, he set his mindset out to try and bankrupt me. And honestly, God, he was fucking very close to doing that because he wrote off everything that I ever gave him to drive. Now, anyway... He's still one of the nicest people you've ever met in your and and he defied logic. He went to Indianapolis and won two five Indy five hundred. So I mean it's unbelievable. I don't know how he ever did that, but then never mind. Honda insisted that he drive the car. Uh, I had to get rid of Frenson. But you know, my engine bill at the time, as Rob will tell you, was about eighteen million dollars. And I'm trying to figure out who is going to who's most valuable to the team. Is it Heinz Harald friends and, and run the risk. I don't want to be a bankrupt hero. And that's what I could have been with Heinz Harald if I had to pay the full price for the engine or get the free engines, which had a valuation of 18 million. So Sato got to drive. I know Rob was unhappy. I was unhappy. No one was happy about the decision. But that's sometimes reality. And it's no harm in real life to understand sometimes you can't always have the things that you want. And sometimes it's a compromise. And sometimes you have to evaluate what's in front of you and then take the best way forward. I understood that, you know, Rob left and went off to Ferrari or Williams, wherever it was, um, and other drivers and other engineers went with him because I lost a lot of, I lost, a lot of momentum at that stage. It was heading into the 2000s. There was lots of pressure on money in terms of um, cigarette was becoming a band sponsor. So I had to think about the Honda thing more, especially to stay alive. That was the critical time. So do I? Uh, am I ever upset that I made the decision? No, it was the only decision. And the only thing about life is there's, there's, there's nothing worse than a bad decision except one thing. And that is not making a decision at all. The important thing is if you make a bad decision, you can learn by it. By making no decision, then you are completely stuffed. And uh, so that's where I come from. So I hope I've answered the question. Rob, it's all yours. Well said, EJ. Uh, and I, I, we, we should remember a very happy thing that came out of that was that I got to engineer uh, Jean Alesi for a few races, if you remember. I uh, from when 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 Heinz left as well, uh, yeah. So that was good fun. That was fairly fiery, um, but I enjoyed that. Uh, and we're mates now, which we weren't at the time. Um, <laughs> so that's good. Um, but I also remember. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's good questions, DC. But I think that it comes down to right. You have to be. You have to be professional, and especially at the start of your career, right? You're kind of learning. So, like, who are you to, like, kind of sit there and say, oh, well, this driver isn't up to, to, to scratch or whatever. you just got to get your head down uh, and, and, and get on with it. I think that – I think one good thing about Eddie was, was if we go back to them days, is that he was always very cognizant, let's say, of the – the the paying driver perhaps not being able to deliver. Now I've been in situations uh, where you know the team boss 
has been has been less cognizant of that and has expected miracles. And I think that uh, you know when you're in that situation, that that is that that's hard to swallow. You know when you kind of you supposed to have all of the engineering perfect from concept to delivery um and then there's somebody in the in in the seat uh what did we call him carlos fandango or or <laughs> you call him <laughs> yeah, it could be <laughs> carlos uh, fandango suits <laughs> rob we get we get put in jail I, I, it was actually, I said Archie Gemmell, who was a footballer. Archie Gemmell. Or a manager. Archie Gemmell, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Archie Gemmell. No, and I tell you, DC, you are such a dick, DC. He is world famous. Archie Gemmell was a legend, for God's sake, man. Shame on you for not knowing that. <laughs> well, I said his name, so he's legendary enough that I knew his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, don't digress, please. Um, so the, uh, yeah, so I, I think the, I don't know, latterly probably I, I did start to think that, well, you know, if we're putting 10 tenths in or 110% from the engineering and, and the delivery of the whole thing, and then you've got people in the car who are not capable of of, of, of winning, then that is slightly disheartening, yeah. But at the end of the day, uh, it, it, it's a team, right? You work for the team and whatever whatever decision the team makes – you have to just get on with it. Uh, and I think that, again, it comes down to what I was talking about before, is you've got to get the best out of whatever you've got, uh, you know, um, and whether that's the driver or the car that aren't quite up to par, you've still got to go out and try and get 10 tenths out of it. And if that means that, you know, you score sixth rather than win, um, well, you've still done your job. So there you go. Am I rambling? Am I, am I, am I wittering at this point? <laughs> Not yeah, just all. a little. <laughs> of course you are. No different to you, DC or I. We're ramblers at heart. We're, we're taking money under false pretenses doing this podcast, I should remind you, Rob. It's a gravy trail that you would love. You'd be very proud of me. You cannot imagine the amount of stash that I get out of doing this program. <laughs> I do it for the love. And DC is the payer. He owns the company. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. There's the madness of EJ. I was very nervous about you when they told me that you were going to be on the program. I said, oh, Jesus, do I still owe him money? Um, what's the story <laughs> yes, with Ross yes. Medley? Um, because he was always... No, that's not true. I don't owe you a dime. So the, the thing is that I was never know what, what people are going to come out and say. It could be very complimentary, as you have. I'm very impressed, by the way, with your, your memory bank that's able to come up with these things. But, you know, we must be very important. Life is very short, and I'd say this to everyone out there. You must make sure that you get as much out of it as you can. And by that, I'm talking about, in your case, a bit of education, a bit of fun. But you must have a good balance and a good mix. And for me, I have to say, looking back, the Formula 3, Formula 3000, you mentioned John Alessi there, who was a champion in our car in Formula 3. Look, he was never easy, but he, he delivered and he was great fun. And as you rightly say... Years have rolled by. I've become, he's become a much more mellow guy um, because he was friction from the very start to the beginning of his, of his racing career, but a delightful, delightful man. And um, so I think everyone out there needs to learn perhaps a little lesson. And that is, as we go through life, there's going to be ups and downs, but make sure uh, you take all of the good things and realize how lucky we are to be in the position that we currently are. I agree with that uh, completely. I think that, you know, uh, all three of us on this call, um, we haven't got much to, 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 to moan about, right? Um, but, you know, uh, I think that we've all made our own luck as well, you know. Uh, what was, what, DC, what did your boss, your old boss used to say, Ron, didn't he say that you make your own luck or there is no luck or something like that? He, he, was, he had some Ronism for it. Um, but I think the reality is, is, is that we are particularly fortunate, right? There's a lot of right, right place, right time. Uh, but there's also getting hold of it and just um, doing the absolute best you can and having a bloody good time while you're doing it. Why not? Well, here, here to that. I think that is a, a wonderful place for us to thank Rob for joining us. We could, I'm sure, continue to 
ramble on and share stories and have a have a great little sparring session but uh i think for our listeners it's probably about enough for today so to remember to follow us on formula for success on spotify and whenever you listen to your podcasts and you can find us on social media with the handle at f1 for success actually rob are you on social media are you anything you need to ident uh i am rsmedley73 i've just joined instagram um I did it to annoy my kids. So yeah, go on there and follow me because you'll annoy them even more. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do that. EJ's just come on Instagram as well. So uh, I've given EJ a follow. I'm going to go on R Smedley 73, 73, giving himself a shout out to the fact that that's the year you were born, I assume. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> I can't hope. Indeed. I'm, I'm 71. <laughs> Yeah, you can't hate from that one. <laughs> You've got all those helmets behind you. I doubt if you paid for any any of those. So uh, have you worked, uh, you know, evaluation listing in there? Have you put any of them on insurance? Do you remember that one? Oh, my God. Absolutely. We did a great... That was a pit stop. That was the pit stop. It was great. And they were yellow. And we did a, a great video on that. Uh, Rob, honestly, you're recalling uh, a lot of things in my mind that went on during those times. Um, and that yellow, I, I'll never forget the day, and I, I think you were there when um, um, uh, Johnny Lydon of, of the, the, the Pistols came to have his photograph taken and he wanted oh, a helmet yeah. like that on his head and then he painted his head. He had his hair coloured the same thing. He, he took his tooth out and he wanted to look as evil as he possibly could be. He didn't have to work too hard on that, by the way, but anyway, yeah, he did look quite evil. Um, <laughs> But um, great memories. Rob, thanks for coming on. It's been absolutely a joy and a pleasure for me. You go well, brother. You look great. Thanks, boys. See you soon.